Hi, and welcome to Gardens Gone Wild. My name is Katherine Wells. I'm president of Denton County Master Gardener Association, your neighbor just down the road. I'm also on the board of directors for the Master Naturalist Program of Texas, the Elm Fork chapter. I'm also on the board for the Flower Mound Foundation and a member of NIPSOT, the Native Plant Society of Texas, our Trinity Forks chapter in the area. And I'm also appointed to place 10 of the Town of Flower Mound Environmental Conservation Commission. And so I'm delighted to be with you today in cyberspace. I wish we could meet in person, but a virtual presentation is the next best thing. So I appreciate you inviting me to share. And what we're gonna talk about today are uh, several topics about wildscaping your yard and your garden and your property, no matter what size it is to benefit our native flora and fauna and our migratory friends and our resident wildlife friends. So before we get started, I just wanted to say that this is usually about a two hour presentation and I go in to a lot of depth about the plants um, that are mentioned, but because you're master gardeners and you know all of that, I have, I have tried to streamline and condense this presentation into about an hour today. So we're gonna fluff over some of the things you probably already know and just focus on really three issues that we're facing as far as wildscaping. Three things that wildlife needs to survive and thrive in our ecosystem, and then 15 tips to help us support them. So most of the photographs that you'll see are my own photos, and most of them are documentations of some things that we've done on our property. Um, helps me avoid copyright infringements just to show you things that we've done ourselves. There's no worry about attributions for that. I do have a few photos um, to which I've given attribution um, that are provided by other folks or are either stock photos from Canva. So let's talk about why we care. So a healthy, whole, fully functioning, self-regulating, self-correcting ecosystem relies on the symbiosis of indigenous flora and fauna. Species do not exist in isolation. And there are a few issues that we face with that. The first one is habit fragmentation. That can take place through larger projects such as construction and development, it can also take place on a smaller scale, such as having your property fenced in. So it's not easy for wildlife to move in and out. Another issue is habitat homogenization. That's where we look at monocultures, a lack of plant diversity, alien plants, things that are not native, that have no sense of place and no sense of purpose in our ecosystem here. A third issue is habitat sterilization. That would include the use of all the ides, herbicides and pesticides. Um, really there's a lack of food and a lack of habitat for our native wildlife species. So before we move forward, I want to show you the power of one. So the video is, is not quite as crisp as it usually is, um, but what you're looking at is one plant, shrubby bone set, Agrotina havanensis. And this was in my garden. Let me wait for the video to end and I'll pull up the name and give you some more details. So many beautiful pollinators. So that is shrubby bone set, Agrotina havanensis. And I have several videos just like this that were documented over a two week period in late October, early November of 2018, where I documented 49 species just on that one plant. Not 49 individuals, but 49 species with countless individuals. 
And you know, that popped up in a front pollinator bed that I'll show you a little bit later in the presentation. And I didn't plant it. I thought it was a weed. Um, and I almost pulled it, but I kind of err on the side of not pulling something, if I don't know what it is, to wait and see what it's gonna become. And so this was one of the plants that I'm really, really glad I did not pull out because once I figured out what it was, I have added many more of those to the landscape throughout my yard. Now this is an indigenous plant to the Edwards Plateau. So it likes rocky hillsides and well-drained sand, loam, clay, and limestone. Um, sun or part shade, woodland edges. So it's not really indigenous to Dallas County or Denton County, but it will work here. And in particular, it works in this location because as you'll see later, this is a little semicircular bed in the middle of a concrete driveway and a roadway that receives harsh sun all day long and no supplemental irrigation at all except for rainfall. So this plant is very happy right there. But I want you to remember that this plant and these pollinators are not existing in isolation. There are more practices that support their presence here. And that's what we're going to take a look at now. So the first thing, what does wildlife need? Well, they need the same thing that people need, food and water and shelter. Shelter comes in, the, in two forms, for hiding places and then for nesting places. And by the way, these three items are also the elements that are required by the National Wildlife uh, Federation if you want to certify your yard as a certified wildlife habitat. And that program is available online if you wanted to research it. Our property is certified. Um, you just have to answer a few questions um, and uh, make sure that you have what they require to support the wildlife. You too can have a certified, uh, a certified wildlife habitat. So let's take a look at these elements. So the first thing is food. This video that you're looking at now, remember the, the one day of snow that we had this December? It snowed for a few hours on a Saturday morning. So I was looking out of my dining room window. This beautiful little northern mockingbird was having bed and breakfast. It was in the Yopon holly tree there, just eating berries while it sheltered itself from the snow, which was kind of fun. I loved seeing that. Water. Here's a very intrepid fox squirrel. What you're seeing there, that, that blue flotation device is called a frog log. It just helps wildlife if they were to fall in the pool, it gives them a little leg up to help them get out. Um, you could accomplish the same thing with a log or a long pole or a stick or anything that would provide a climbing portal to get out of the pool if something fell in. But that little fox, squirrel was pretty intrepid because he was using it to balance on and drink out of the pool. I don't recommend a pool as your source of water. There are other sources that we'll talk about later that would be better for wildlife, but he was taking advantage of what was available. And so this is another one on another day, just drinking right from the water feature. They're pretty ingenious. So after food and water, there's shelter. And what you're seeing now is a little nest of Eastern cottontail bunnies. We have them every year in our yard usually. It's always a delight to find them. And sometimes they nest in the most inopportune places. So when we talk about food for wildlife, I'm mainly referring to native plants and these points you already know, but native plants will withstand particular temperature, rainfall and wind extremes that we have right here in Dallas County and Denton County in our particular ecosystem. They will thrive in mostly alkaline soils, which is what we tend to have in this area, either clay or sand. A lot of you live in 
areas where the soil is, is clay. I happen to live on a little finger of the cross timbers, on the edge of the cross timbers, that is sand. Walking in my yard is like walking on the beach. And so when we first moved here and everyone was talking about watering your foundation because of the shrink and swell clay, I didn't know what they were talking about because our soil is sandy. But anyway, whether you have clay or whether you have have sand, there are native plants for our area that will thrive in those soils. Our native plants also resist diseases and they nurture our indigenous wildlife. So some considerations when you're choosing them, as you know, is it going to be for sun or shade, clay versus sand, dry conditions versus wet conditions. We do not have any supplemental irrigation on our property. We do live a little bit farther out, so we're on a septic system. The only supplemental irrigation I have other than rainfall is from the aerobic septic spray field, and I can't really control that. So uh, we just try to put the plants that, that like wet conditions a little bit better near the aerobic spray field. Um, you'll also want to consider the fruiting blooming cycles of the berries and the fruits and the nectar and the seeds. So there's always something blooming or available for wildlife. So this is just a quick example that I wanted to share. When we first moved into this home, and we've been here, it'll be 10 years in November, um, the homeowner had lovely plantings. A lot of them were not natives, and you'll recognize this as a non-native honeysuckle. Um, it was beautiful, smelled great, but do you remember the one year that we had a temperature extreme that went like 70 degrees, like from 90 down to 20 in a matter of 12 hours in one day? Well, that didn't take it, and so when it died, I replaced it with Carolina jessamine, and it thrives. As you know, beautiful blooms, it's an evergreen. It, it takes whatever Texas weather can dish out. So as some of the alien plants that I have inherited with this property are dying and waning, I am replacing them with natives. Uh, for water, one size does not fit all because you've got creatures great and small. So different water sources for your wildlife can include a little saucer with pebbles in it, a bird bath, a pond, a pool, although as I said, that's not my recommended source. And some considerations are to keep it clean, to keep it filled, and to provide an escape route, just like we talked about with the frog log um, a few minutes ago. So here's some examples. This photo is actually from a Denton County Master Gardener named Irene Gannon. This is her yard, and she's made a little butterfly puddler with a pretty pedestal and a saucer. She has a little water in there with a pebble, so butterflies and smaller creatures have a safe place where they can sip without getting inundated by the water. Um, there's a little close up, so you can see the pebbles where there's a, a landing spot um, and the water available around them. So another master gardener, uh, gardener Angie Lindsay, she's actually going to be on our garden tour, which was supposed to be, as your garden tour was, the spring. Ours has now been postponed till October the 10th. And we hope that that rescheduled date is going to work. We'll see, we'll see what unfolds and what everything looks like um, as, as we near the end of the summer. But hopefully our garden tour will take place and Angie's home is on it. And so she's made a similar butterfly puddler um, with a plant stand, a little saucer, and a lot of little pebbles and water. So this is at Global Sphere Center um, in Denton County, and it's just a beautiful pond that they have created and added to their landscape there, which is another option, a little bit bigger and more permanent option for a water source for wildlife. So for shelter, as we said, we need a place for them to hide and seek. They need cover, they need a place to nest, and they need protection from predators. And some considerations is, the shelter piece 
is the biggest void in most suburban landscapes. Forgive me, that's a reminder of something else that I've got going on today. Um, another consideration is a range of heights and revolving maturities. So you want things lower to the ground for smaller creatures. You want some taller canopies for high flying creatures and you want some revolving maturities around that as well. You also want to think about evergreen versus deciduous and annuals versus perennials. Everything from small like little hollow plant stalks to really tall like uh, shade tree canopies. It can include constructed houses like a birdhouse, for example. One important point to remember is that immaculate maintenance strips habitat of important cover. So if you're a little bit of a messy gardener, then that is a good thing for your wildlife. So here, for example, is a bluebird box that is in my backyard. You will notice the baffle on the pole. That's to help uh, for predators. Uh, protection from predators. It's also positioned in an area with a hole the proper size for bluebirds and other cavity nesters in an effort to uh, to keep all the intruders out. What you'll also see in the background, yes, that's red tip fetinia. When we bought this property, we inherited a lot of those and they are gradually dying out uh, due to entomosporum leaf spot disease. As they are dying, we were replacing them with natives and other um, evergreen perennials, um, but we still have a few left. So here, I usually have two to three clutches of bluebird nests every year, uh, two to three clutches in that bluebird nest every year. Uh, this was, I think, last year. The little bluebirds, freshly hatched, fresh hatchlings, a few, days, a few days later, they're growing up, getting a little more feathers on them. So cute. Then the other thing I see a lot, oh, I did wanna just back up to say that um, I wanted to remind everybody of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which says it is illegal to take, possess, import, export, transport, sell, purchase, or barter any migratory bird or bird parts such as feathers, nests, or eggs without a valid federal permit. It excludes non-native species such as house sparrows and European starlings, and there's limited protection in season for game birds uh, such as duck, geese, doves, and some shorebirds. So when I'm documenting photographs like this, I don't take the nest out of the box. I put my camera inside and just try to point down and click and, and hope I come out with an image that is uh, worthy of documentation. So the other thing I see a lot, and you probably do too, are northern cardinals. And they tend to build nests in the shrubby layers of the landscape, about ranging from three to three feet to 10 feet from the ground. I have found them in my yard in everything from rose bushes, particularly rose bushes, I don't know why they like rose bushes, but they do, um, to yopon holly trees. Another thing that I see a lot are Carolina wrens. They are, and Bewix wrens too. They're cavity nesters like the Eastern bluebirds. So make sure you check your potted plants and your hanging baskets and your garden shoes even um, for, for these little nests. So a lot of people are using bee houses. Um, this is not actually a bee, this is a ringed paper wasp, but some folks are making little bee habitats. And what they've done here is just drilled holes in old sticks and logs and, um, and made a bee house. I have found in my yard, I don't have one of these. This is a photo um, taken at a, at a park in South Carolina when I visited my family last year. I don't have these. Um, I've found that just with my, uh, my native plants and with the, the habitat maintenance and preservation that we do, that our bees have plenty of nesting places. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in the 
later on in the presentation, um, but you certainly can do things like this. I would caution you to make sure it's kept clean and, um, you know, there's, there's some maintenance that might go along with that to make sure there's no parasites in it. Okay, so now let's move into our 15 strategies for how to do this. The first one is to lay it on, layer it on. And we're talking about all different levels of plants, everything from ground covers to grasses and flowers and shrubs to understory trees to canopy trees. Some considerations are to plan for similar needs. So as we mentioned before, make sure you have all your sun lovers together, your uh, the, the drought tolerant plants together, the ones that might do well in an aerobic spray field together. Um, actually, Margaret Marshall, one of your uh, members, gifted me a white Texas star hibiscus last year. If you're watching, thank you, Margaret, and hi. Um, and because I don't have supplemental irrigation, I planted that underneath um, some live oaks on the edge of the aerobic spray field where it gets some protection from the sun and it also gets the water whenever, whenever that spray goes off. And it has been very happy. I got some blooms last week and I was so excited about that. So more than one way to, um, to, to plan, I suppose. You also want to mix deciduous with evergreen so not everything is bare at the same time. And you wanna kind of drift it for depth and dimension as opposed to lining everything up in a, in a straight line. So we wanna think from the ground up. Sparrows, for example, are ground dwellers. They're gonna like that protection and that cover near the ground. Mockingbirds like understory trees. Our northern mockingbirds, for example, love the yopon hollies. And swallows are high flyers. They like more of the tall canopy trees. And so some deciduous but blooming mid-side trees for the sun would include uh, Mexican plum, which is an early bloomer, Mexican buckeye, uh, desert willows, also eastern red buds um, are, are great choices. So this is my backyard. Um, this was a video taken in 2018, it was raining. Kind of gives you an idea of what it looked like a couple years ago. And now I'm gonna show you a couple of photos of what it has looked like over the years. So that was it a couple years ago when we first bought the property in November of 2010, this was the photograph in, uh, in the multiple listing for the backyard. And it's beautiful. A lot of you will probably prefer this picture to some pictures I'm going to show you in a little bit. But what you don't really see, other than some of those wonderful native trees in the background, um, those are live oaks and some red Schumard oaks is most of what you see is not a native plant. So almost all of that died. This is what that looked like a couple years later. So the first picture was 2010. This was by 2014, March of 2014. All of that had died. You see where the red tip petunias had died out, a lot of the understory trees. I mean, it was just, not pretty. And there's another picture. An another thing is those beautiful oak trees had been surrounded by the little cement circles, which as you know, is not good for the tree's root flare. So one thing we did was break apart those, um, those little decorative uh, cement circles and expose the root flare by removing the dirt that covered it so the tree could breathe a little bit more. So then let's see what year this was. Well, this was last year. By August of 2019, we had worked to provide some understory canopy to those indigenous oak trees. There's live oaks, there's red Schumard oak. I've added uh, 
Yopon hollies, there's some detura there in the front for that time of year near the Bluebird house. Um, there are all kinds of things in there right now. I've got a list. There's probably, I don't know, uh, 30 plus species in there now with all different um, layers. And I'll show you some more pictures in a little bit. This picture uh, was taken also in 2019. And then this picture was taken this morning. So you can see every year I gradually add a little bit more. So the difference between this you can kind of see behind the chaise lounges there on the pool deck, there, there really wasn't anything growing. I was gradually cardboarding and mulching the area to try and kill the Bermuda grass so I could add more native plants. And so then this year, as a work in progress, there's some Cenizo, some Texas sage, there's pink evening primrose, um, there's some rosemary, uh, there's some zinnias in there. There are um, a lot of other things that I have added to try and um, reduce the footprint of the grass as much as possible. So a second, uh, a second principle is to live on the edge. And the edge effect you've probably heard of. Um, we'll talk about the edge. Well, let's talk about the edge effect right now. The richest habitat and the greatest a uh, number of species occur where prairies and forests meet. And we do have that ecosystem here in Denton County and also in Dallas County. So that, that's a very rich place to be. Um, that involves native wildflowers and grasses and shrubs and trees of ranging heights and revolving maturities, as we, as we have mentioned. Considerations, resist monoculture. Even in native plants, we don't want such a monoculture of one species that there's no balance. Um, living on the edge reduces your maintenance. Here's an example of edge habitat near my home in Southwest Flower Mound. This is um, empty land that is not empty land. It is undeveloped land that uh, leads to the core property along Lake Grapevine. And you can see the wonderful prairie in the front with the native wildflowers, while you see along the back where the edge of that cross timbers forest is. So just a beautiful, wonderful convergence of those two systems. So a, a third principle is to appreciate the seedy side of life and that means leaving some seed bearing plants ungroomed. Some considerations for that, they can add archi architectural interest uh, out of season. They definitely supply food for birds and other wildlife and they help with species propagation. So inland sea oats is uh, a really good one. A lot of our resident seed eaters, including northern cardinals, and a lot of the resident and migrating sparrows, chipping sparrows, white uh, crown sparrows, white-throated sparrows, they like these seed-bearing plants. There's a picture of the inland sea oats um, in the fall when they've turned brown, and I think it's just as beautiful and adds architectural interest. It does like moisture areas, so it's planted near the edge of my aerobic spray field under the live oaks along with the white Texas star hibiscus from Margaret and some other moist, uh, moisture loving plants. So this is a little white throated sparrow. What they're eating, what this one's eating, there was more than one, is dandelion seeds. And you know, I was that girl for the longest time. I would run around my yard and pluck up every dandelion, never got rid of them because we've got a, a fairly large property and you just couldn't get them all. So I saw one day that the, um, the pollinators, especially the little pollinators, our bees, were really enjoying the blossoms on those 
uh, dandelions. So I resolved that I would leave the dandelion blooms in place. And then when they turned to seed, I would run around and pick all the seed heads up before they had a chance to spread. Well, then I saw these wonderful little sparrows who really subsist on them in the fall and winter. And so then I resolved, I would just let the dandelions grow where they may and support the wildlife in every stage of the dandelion's life. Now, they are not a native plant. They are pretty adapted to our area. Um, and so you can do what you will. If you do wanna pull them, uh, you can use the leaves and salads. You can use the roots for a tea, so. Um, so anyway, that's my dandelion story. So a fourth tip is to be berry diversified. And that means to include as many native berry producers as your landscape will hold. And again, we're thinking vertically from the ground up. So some shrubs that you may want to consider. American beautyberry, coral berry, common elderberry, and pigeon berry. And this is where I talk a lot about the different plants, but I won't do that today in an effort to save time. And because I know you all are very well schooled um, in, in the plants, but I will show you some pretty pictures. There's an American beauty berry. There it is flowering. There's a pigeon berry. Pigeon berry is another one on that, in that under canopy area uh, near the aerobic spray field. And so some mid-level under canopy trees that you could also consider would be Carolina cherry laurel, that's never green, possum haw holly, southern wax myrtle, which is not indigenous to this area, but it is a favorite for our migrating yellow rumped warblers. I did add one to my yard a couple of years ago, and I saw a yellow rumped warbler for the first time shortly after adding it but it's died, so I'm not sure. I know it's not indigenous to this area, to this particular ecosystem. So I don't know if I'm gonna try again with that or try something else, but it is a consideration. And also, of course, the Yopon hollies. Some vines, just as a reminder, you can use them as a ground cover or you can train them upright. And some to consider include Carolina snail seed and Virginia creeper. So here's a northern mockingbird and a yopon holly in the backyard. There's just a little close up of the berries. That was when they were just changing from green to red. There it is in the winter. A wonderful winter source of food for our birds. And the northern mockingbirds really are territorial of it, especially when the migrating cedar wax wings come through. There's a northern mockingbird. I'm not sure if you can hear him from my computer. Just happy, singing his little heart out. Earlier, you might have seen him do a, a do a double take. It was a, a blue jay that flew by and he was really trying to decide, I think, if he was supposed to defend his post from that blue jay. So here are the cedar wax wings that I mentioned. They come through in late winter and really can just strip a yopon holly, a possum haw holly of every berry that is left and the northern mockingbirds don't have a whole lot of defense because the cedar wax wings come in groves they just come in packs the fox squirrels also like the yopon hollies although i don't think he was eating a berry he was probably eating a pecan that he had buried and saved for later uh, there's a beautiful picture this was a possum haw holly um, against a beautiful January blue sky. Isn't that gorgeous? And some of the vines that I mentioned, there's the Carolina snail seed when it was uh, bearing fruit, Virginia creeper. Although you do have to be careful about Virginia creeper because it's a native, 
but it will kind of sort of take over. Um, it does have adhesive discs though, instead of rootlets, so it won't damage buildings. Um, it is a larval host for some sphinx moths. And as you see, it's a super spreader. Um, grape vines, we have a lot of muscadine and mustang grapes growing wild in the area and I see them in my yard a lot. That's a fence line across from my house um, and, and the grape vines just cover it. So a fifth strategy is just to go nuts. The best way to do that is with tall tree canopies and some considerations Food diversity for larger avian species like your blue jays and your crows and your woodpeckers. As a bonus, it provides cover, shelter, a lookout point, a gathering spot, and it keeps the resident squirrels happy and full. So here is another fox squirrel. This one was just hanging out, eating upside down. <laughs> Yes, I'm talking to you. Why are you eating upside down? We have a lot of oak trees, blackjack oaks, post oaks in the area, red shumark, shumard oaks, as I've mentioned, and um, burr oak, uh, live oaks, and we also have a pecan tree. So our squirrels are pretty fat and happy, and they really don't destroy or tear up anything else, I think, just because we have enough nuts to keep them happy. Here's another one on another day underneath. Uh, this was winter because the possum haw holly had lost its leaves, but it looks like it's probably eating a pecan, a buried treasure. And as I mentioned, those petunias in the background, uh, the red tip petunias, as they are dying out, I'm replacing them with evergreen natives like Carolina cherry laurel and evergreen sumac and, and yopon hollies. So again, I mentioned some oaks. I talked about uh, blackjack burr, escarpment, the live oaks, post oaks, shumard red oaks, and of course the, pe the pecan. Um, those are really good sources of nuts. Um, that would be natives for the area. And, and just as an aside, you probably know this, but our native oaks are so beneficial in so many ways. They actually support more than 500 species of caterpillars and 96% of our terrestrial birds feed uh, insects, including caterpillars, to their young. One Carolina chickadee, for example, requires 9,000 caterpillars to feed one brood of five nestlings. So that is a lot of food and a lot of work for mom and dad. Um, and our native oaks supply those caterpillars for that. Um, I think I have a picture. There's a Carolina chickadee. This is a Canva stock photo because I, ha I have not been able to get a good photograph of our chickadees in the yard. There's a picture of a burr oak, I'm sorry, a blackjack oak um, in our side yard. And this tree was actually recognized as a tree of the year for the town of Flower Mound in 2017 as one of the largest blackjack oaks in the area. There's a red shumard in our backyard. There's a pecan. And before we move on, the one thing I wanted to mention too is that Dr. Alexandra Panette Gonzalez, who is a professor at UNT in Denton County, has done a study about carbon filtration. And she has found that out of all the oak trees in the area, the post oaks are the best urban air filters for our area. Um, if you're interested, you might wanna Google her, Dr. Alexandra Panette Gonzalez. She had a lot of wonderful information, very helpful research um, that would be interesting. Um, and the post oaks provided more air filtration, even though they're deciduous, than the evergreen live oaks in the area, which was interesting. Um, but then also just to speak of that beautiful pecan tree, as you know, pecans are our Texas state tree. So a sixth way is to use the buddy system. 
guess what that is? Flower power. And so some considerations for that are the size and structure of the plants, the seasonal cycles. So I'm gonna go through a lot of photographs. We're gonna go pretty quickly. And I've arranged them just so you know in order of their bloom time. So normally I go through, I talk about each of the plants, when it blooms, what it likes, all of this. But today we're just gonna look at the different wildlife they support. Um, and we're gonna go a little bit quickly through it. So you might recognize this as pink evening primrose, which is Onothera speciosa. And what we're looking at right now is a dark morph Eastern tiger swallowtail. And this is an Eastern tiger swallowtail. Really getting that pollen. So beautiful. And then here we have one of our native bees. That's a green sweat bee. Also really just, if you hear splashing in the background, our, our Labrador retriever Pearl is taking a dip in the pool when I took that video. So then moving on to Texas mountain laurel, that is a blueberry mason bee. And here is a video of the blueberry mason bee with a western honeybee. Beautiful. Just love that rich color, especially on the purple blooms of the Texas mountain laurel. And again, the Texas mountain laurels aren't really indigenous to our particular ecosystem, but they will, they will work here. And here's a video of an Eastern tiger swallowtail. And then a white lined sphinx moth. with some Western honeybees in the background there. Not a native species, but who doesn't like honey? So this is mealy blue sage, uh, Salvia farinacea, and this is an American bumblebee. American bumblebees and the bigger bees really love this plant for some reason. I see them a lot in my garden. They are buzz pollinators, so it's hard to get a really good picture of them. Um, but that buzz pollination that they have really also benefits a lot of edibles like blueberries and uh, tomatoes. There is a southern carpenter bee. There's some monarchs. A black swallowtail. And a snowberry clear wing moth. That's also known as the hummingbird moth. And the larva for that uh, feed on honeysuckle and viburnum and hawthorn and snowberry, as you might guess, and cherry and mint and plum. So the next plant is Greg's mist flower, Conoclinium gregii. Uh, that was a bordered patch. This is an American snout. That is a variegated fritillary, a gulf fritillary, fiery skipper, a queen, Lots of queens, monarch, and monarch. All love the Greg's mist flower. Then if you don't have a lot of room for these super spreading plants, a lot of what we've, we've shown are what we call super spreaders. Um, you can have zinnias, just a beautiful cut flower that supports pollinators as well. And if you have a smaller property, you can even grow these in, uh, on your patio, in planters and um, containers like that. So this is a beautiful gulf fritillary, a black swallowtail, And that is a Western giant swallowtail, all loving the zinnia. Okay, this plant is the one that I showed in the video at the very beginning. This was the shrubby bone set, the Agratina habanensis. And this is the one that I found so many species. 
supporting, it was supporting so many species. This is an Elanthus webworm moth, an American snout, a bordered patch, dainty sulfur, dusky blue ground streak, fiery skipper, a great purple hair streak, a green sweat bee, Hawaiian bee webworm moth, and that is a hypocala moth or a hypocala moth. Um, it's also called an owlet moth. I wasn't real familiar with it, but the larvae feed on persimmon trees. I don't have a persimmon tree in on my property, although I'd like one, but there's surely somebody must have one close by for me to find the adult in my yard. Um, you'll also find hoverflies like margined calligraphers. That is a melon worm moth. A favorite uh, larval host is squash, as you might guess from the name. Monarch. And that is a looper moth aka a cabbage looper. Um, the larval hosts for this one are a lot of the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cabbage. And it's called a looper because the, the caterpillars really highly arch their back when they are crawling. So if you see a tiny little caterpillar with a really pronounced loop um, or arch, it could, be, it could be a looper moth. And that is a potter or a mason wasp, a queen, a red paper wasp. That is a Texas nomad bee. And it is not the best bee, you guys. It is a kleptoparasite. And that means it steals pollen from the nest of our other native ground nesting bees, including our mining and our sweat bees. It parasitizes the nest of other ground nesting bees, and it doesn't gather pollen. It only drink, drinks the nectar. So this little bee is pretty, but it's a real taker and not a giver. That butterfly is a Fiona checker spot, and that is a thread-waisted wasp, a very beneficial wasp. It's a hunter and ambush predator. Um, it, does, it does hunt and ambush caterpillars. And this is a yellow collared skate moth. So looking at Indian blanket, uh, this is an American lady. One way you can tell the difference between the American lady and the painted lady is I, I can't really point for you to be able to tell what I'm pointing at and I don't, I don't have a clicker. Um, but you see in the orange cell, there's a little white dot. And then on the back wing, there are two pronounced eye spots from this view. That indicates an American lady. If it were a painted lady, there would not be a white spot in that orange cell, and there would be more like four smaller, less pronounced eye spots on that back wing. And that is a checkered slash common skipper. That uh, species has morphed so much in our area that we, we kind of call it a checkered common complex as opposed to being able to really distinguish which of the two species it is would require uh, microscopes and um, invasive tools. So, so we don't, we don't want to know which one it is that badly. I just want it to be alive and enjoy, um, enjoy nectaring on, on the Indian blanket. That's a Danny Sulphur. That is a chimney bee. It's a digger bee, a ground nester, and it's a solitary bee, but a communal nester. Um, it's a generalist forager, and it's not defensive or aggressive. So if you see one of those in your garden, it's, it's a delight. They're, they're good to have. That is a longhorned bee. It's also a ground nester, and it's an important pollinator of our agricultural crops in the area. Um, and then there's just a hodgepodge of a few that we've seen, the checkered common skipper, the variegated fritillary, that green bee in the bottom right is a sweat bee, and then our uh, western honeybee, not our because 
it's not native, but we like them just the same, the western honeybee in the, in the left there. Now I'm sure you know what this is, the fall aster, aka the aromatic aster. That's a beautiful bordered patch. That is a, lig a ligated or a ligated furrow bee. And then a monarch. Because this is a fall blooming plant, um, the monarchs really enjoy this in their fall migration. Then these are just some miscellaneous plants. This is Blackfoot Daisy, a Dany Sulphur on that, and the Texas Sage Cenizo with an American Bumblebee. Gulf Fritillary on Turk's Cap, and you can probably see there on the right hand side of the picture there's American Pokeweed growing. I have a lot of Pokeweed in my yard. It comes up, the berries really support the wildlife, and I just let it go. These are different bees on Datura, some western honeybees and then our native green sweat bee. A mud dauber, the yellow-legged mud dauber on the Texas mountain laurel leaf. You can probably tell while it's, why it's there. You see the water droplets. It's probably using some of that moisture to help make its mud, uh, its mud nesting cavities. So a um, gray hair streak on salvia. That, I think that's autumn sage there. A gray hair streak on our Texas rock rose. An eastern carpenter bee on the native passion flower, Passiflora incarnata, which you can tell because it's got a three-lobed le three leaf. Oh, uh, in comparison to a non- native passion flower, which has, this particular one has a five lobed leaf. So that's one way you can tell the native from the uh, non-native. And then this is a yard aster. A lot of people think it's a, a weed. It probably is a weed, but it's got the teeny tiny flowers. You can tell there from my thumbnail how small the flowers are, but it supports a lot of little pollinators. Uh, this particular one is a Phaon crescent, and so I, I leave them and encourage them and let them go. Then this is a Maximilian sunflower, and it is a larval host plant for the bordered patch uh, butterfly, and those are bordered patch caterpillars that are covering um, covering those leaves uh, last fall. So our dandelion story, as I said, there's so many uh, little species that are supported by the blooms. These are tiny little native bees here, western honeybees, butterflies too, that's another one of the checkered common skippers. Then even things like cultivated roses. Um, what I would say about the roses is that the loosely petaled roses are better choices for our pollinators than the really tightly petaled ones because the loosely petaled ones allow the, while the uh, pollinators to really get in there and, and, and get what they're after. So this is a Western honey, honeybee. And that video really shows, shows it at work. Other pollinators, such as hoverflies, um, will pollinate as well, although they're not as effective as bees. They are mostly generalists rather than specialists, so that's a good thing. But this particular one is an eastern banded hoverfly. Then that is an oblique stripe tail hoverfly. And this is a northern crab spider preying on a hoverfly. All You can tell how little they are by the petals in comparison in that picture. There's so many, so much of this dynamic going on around us and a lot of it is just too small to notice on a regular basis. So that was a lot for the buddy system, but let's move on to number seven. And that tip is to avoid the ides. Fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, and rodenticides. And some considerations are that the ides really treat problems in isolation, and they cause symbiotic collateral damage. The endemic plants attract endemic organisms, thereby eliminating the need for a lot of ides. 
and the symbiosis develops a healthy ecosystem with a fully functioning food chain, which is really what we're after. And indigenous predators and prey are a natural integrated pest management. Also, the native plants, the more you add, the more that they help uh, crowd out weedy invasives. If you do choose to use organic uh, control measures, please just know that organic can still hurt, it can still kill, it can still be pretty strong. So just use wisdom and follow the instructions on the label when using that. Okay, this is a sphinx moth. We saw one of those earlier in a video. And the dilemma is when you love the moth they become, but you're not so crazy about the hornworm that eats your tomato plants before they turn into that wonderful moth. So this is in the manduka species. It does eat tomatoes, um, but it also likes things in the Onothera species, like the pink evening primrose. So, um, the adults for this are also attracted to Datura. So here's a picture of a hornworm eating the uh, pink evening primrose leaves. And I have oodles of those now. I had none once upon a time. Uh, a friend and master gardener shared some with me and now I have plenty. So if anybody wants some, let me know. I've got plenty to share. But I have so many that that provides a support uh, a, a larval host for these um, without it being really noticeable that the leaves are being eaten and it kind of protects my tomato plants because it offers a diversion. Oh, and then we were talking about the predator prey uh, relationship. This, uh, another way that these hornworms are kept in check is they are often parasitized by wasps, which is what happened to this one. Not a good day for that particular hornworm. So this is a cicada killer wasp, and it has its prey, a cicada. Taking it to its little underground burrow. This is a velvet ant which is also a parasitoid wasp. And as I mentioned before, this predator-prey relationship is always happening from the smallest all the way up to the largest on the food chain. And a lot, a lot of it just happens and we, we're, we're not even aware that it's there. So the eighth tip is to be a stalker. But by that, I mean to leave some plant stalks in your landscape. And some considerations are that native bee species nest and dwell in overwinter in hollow, pithy stalks. Birds eat the seed heads. Dragonflies perch on the bare stalks. You can remove them in late spring when your new fresh plants are coming through. And as you do that, if there's any remaining bee larvae uh, present, you can protect it by just sort of breaking those uh, stalks and scattering the stems underneath um, the plants that are emerging. It will break down, provide good compost, a little bit of mulch for your plants uh, and protect any bee larvae that may be remaining. So some species, uh, bee balm, the wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, and also Joe pie weed, which is the, uh, I can never pronounce that, so I'll just let you read it. Um, but the thing to see here is the fist in the Latin name, the fistulosa and the fistulosum. And the Latin fistula actually means a long, narrow pipe, tubular, hollow, porous, or ulcerous. So if you see that in a Latin name, you can know that those stalks would probably support a lot of our, um, our nesting bees. Um, dragonflies, as we mentioned, that perch on the bare stalks, they like to use those for a hunting ground and they are voracious mosquito eaters. They can eat about 300 mosquitoes a day. So it's wonderful to have that to support them. Now this is a picture of lemon bee balm. It's Monarda citriodora. So it doesn't have that fist in the Latin name. It's not completely hollow. It's not a completely hollow stem like the wild bergamot, but um, 
but it's still a good native plant and it does have dried uh, fruit heads that support many seed eating birds like our sparrows and our wintering goldfinches. And the first picture there on the left was taken in probably early summer. The one on the right was taken in the fall. You can see the difference in what's growing behind it. On the right, there's some detour in the background. Um, but I think they make a lovely architectural uh, interesting element in the fall as well as in the spring. So here is a blue dasher dragonfly taking their perch on some bare stems, overlooking, eating all those mosquitoes. So a ninth tip is to branch out. You want to leave some snags and some stumps around. You want to use caution with that, um, but that will provide safety and shelter for our cavity nesting birds, habitat for our, our wood nesting bees, and you can artfully arrange it. If there's a fallen limb or a branch pile for small spaces, it doesn't have to look messy. You can incorporate it into your landscape. One thing that I've done is used um, some branches that have fallen as kind of a border to my beds, a real natural uh, rustic border. Now please do keep in mind that human safety and your governing regulations prevail, so make sure that you follow that. But some species that will appreciate that effort are woodpeckers. This is a, a red-bellied woodpecker and an eastern screech owl. Those are uh, stock photos. Um, I couldn't get a good, a good photo of our resident owls and woodpeckers. And then this is an Eastern carpenter bee, one of our wood nesting bees. This is actually on a uh, obedient plant. So a 10th tip to grin and bear it. Bear it leaves some areas unmulched and unplanted. Some considerations that will provide habitat for ground nesting bees. The mining bees especially are the first responders of spring. So when the Mexican plums are in bloom, when your edibles are just coming in um, for, the spring, uh, for, the, for the spring, these mining bees are the first ones there to pollinate and they um, are ground nesters. American bumblebees also are buzz pollinators and they like sunny, bare, well-drained patches of soil. So this is a ligated or ligated furrow bee, a native mining bee. Um, I believe this was on American basket flower a couple of years ago. So an 11th tip, leave the leaves. At least you guys leave some. And so some considerations is it provides shelter for small species, bumblebees, lizards, toads, butterfly pupa. It protects plant roots and adds soil structure and nutrients. And it's habitat for insects, which is necessary for our spring bird nestlings. Um, some species that really appreciate that and that overwinter under fallen leaves include uh, banded and red banded hair streaks. They lay their eggs on fallen leaves under sumacs and wax myrtles and several oak species. And removing those leaves destroys the pupating life underneath them. More than 90% of the caterpillars that develop on the plants don't pupate on their hosts. They drop to the ground and they actually uh, pupate under the leaves within little underground chambers. So anytime you use a leaf blower, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or disturb those leaves, you're possibly uh, robbing some life under there. So the leaf litter decay nur uh, nurtures the new plant growth, and it also nurtures the feeding organisms, including the invertebrates that are vital to our food web. And as I mentioned, overwintering insects include, but are not limited to, red banded hair streak. This is one on shrubby bone set. Polyphemus moth. Giant leopard moth. And our yellow garden spiders on some iris foliage there. So a 12th tip, power down. Employ some manual techniques for your garden maintenance. 
some consideration, mechanical maintenance tools can be detrimental to littles and their habitat. So don't blow their cover. Uh, sweeping and raking and real mowing are some alternatives to leaf blowers and uh, lawn mowers. And if you are going to use a lawn mower, I would suggest mowing from the inside out. And that is going to hopefully the sound and the vibration will give wildlife a chance to move to the edges where they will be a little bit safer. Um, they can temporarily evacuate. You can also walk isolated areas of turf first just to try to um, root out anything that may be hiding there and then you can mow safely and then they can they can go back later. Weed sculpting. <laughs> So pulling weeds can actually disturb and destroy the ground nesting bees and other small creatures and organisms. It can, um, it can, un it can uh, disturb the soil balance and it can unearth weed seeds. So consider cutting weeds by hand with pruners or scissors and removing the weedy seed heads and bagging them while protecting the soil and the life within. So I did just want to touch base again on a, on a couple of these points. A leaf blower in a, a little wildlife habitat would kind of be akin to a tornado in a residential neighborhood. It can cause destruction in a matter of seconds. It can destroy dwelling and nesting sites and it maims and kills little creatures. And, you know, it's just a sad day if you have evaded, if you're a little uh, a little creature and you have evaded predation and survived winter only to meet your death by a weed whacker. That's just a sad way to go. So there are more manual techniques that are more humane and they're more environmentally friendly and they might save you a trip to the gym. So here are some little creatures that would be grateful for you for preserving their habitat. Woodhouse toads, they like to sit on my windowsill and look for insects at night. Um, that's a Gulf Coast toad on the right. And our Texas spiny lizard. I have so many of those. They're my little garden buddies. Carolina wolf spider. They are, they live in burrows, so you'll find them at ground level. They're very poor climbers, but they eat grasshoppers and other agricultural pests. And I don't know about at your house, but the grasshoppers has just been, pro they have been prolific here at my house last year and this year. So I'm really trying to preserve all of the, the spiders and the other um, predators of those grasshoppers that I can, birds, um, so they can get those, get those little pests in balance. So number 13, lose the lawn or at least reduce it. Some considerations. A lawn, the turf grass, really provides little to no habitat. And it is, a lawn is the largest irrigated crop in the United States. Across the nation, there are 40 million acres of lawn. And one hour of lawnmower use produces emissions that are equal to driving your car for 100 miles, according to the EPA. And of course, especially in the case of Bermuda, it gets shaded out, it creeps into your bed. So there are just a lot better choices um, in your landscape. It also requires maintenance and money, mowing and waterizing, uh, watering and fertilizing and treating. I think it's funny that we put, we put turf in and then we water it and we feed it and we make it grow and then we cut it. It just seems like the funniest cycle to me. I do know that we need, we need some um, turf covered areas for, for recreation and, and that sort of thing. But I would, I would recommend maybe a third of your landscape um, be preserved for lawn and two thirds for the native plants. Shady and creepy, we talked about that. It gets shaded out and it creeps into your beds. And so I look at my property holistically as yardening. It's not really gardening because I'm using my whole entire yard um, to provide this habitat for the wildlife. 
One thing that I like to use is common yarrow. Before it grows tall with the flowers, it makes a lovely ground cover, pretty lacy foliage. Frog fruit is another one. Um, this is, I think that was a Phaon Crescent perhaps, butterfly on the frog fruit. And also straggler daisy, I like to use a lot, also called horse herb. Um, let me see what's coming up next. So face your fears, number 14. Face your fears. What are your neighbors gonna say? What's your HOA gonna say? What if you run into critters like snakes? And what will your spouse or your significant other say? So some considerations are there are cues of care that you can implement even if you're wildscaping. Um, so it looks cared for and cultivated and not just wild and messy. There is also Senate Bill 198. Um, I wanted to find that. You probably are aware of it, but after the drought in 2011, there were some changes to the Texas property codes. There was a 2011 House Bill 3391, a 2013 Senate Bill 198, and it basically amended the laws on HOA restrictions for water saving and sustainable landscape practices. So some of the points in it are that an HOA may not prohibit a homeowner from composting, installing rain barrels, implementing efficient irrigation systems, planting drought tolerant landscaping, or planting water conserving natural turf. But aesthetic requirements may apply in your, in your HOA and approval is often necessary, almost always necessary but the HOA process cannot be unreasonably delayed um, and your request cannot be unreasonably denied. So that's something to check out if you live, live in an HOA. And then a healthy harmony keeps the ecosystem in balance. Um, these are some cues of care that we talked about, some decomposed granite walkways that are edged, give folks um, a nice way to transverse your property. And you can see on one side there is, um, this was actually taken in the winter, but on one side there are native plants. On the other side, there is a little bit of turf. You can have uh, walkways with flagstone in them. Um, this is in a wilder area, but you've got a pretty rustic fence that is made with natural limbs. There's a cue of care. You can use rocks and boulders to uh, give a little interest to the areas, a little form and substance to the areas. Um, you can add uh, beds with beautiful uh, walls made with stone, edges made with stone. I remember seeing your president, Sandra Ferris, I was watching some of, I've been watching your virtual meetings since we started doing them and Sandra and I have been talking a good bit and I remember admiring Sandra in your backyard in one of your meetings, perhaps the May one, where you showed your beautiful walled area throughout your property um, that hosted a lot of your native plants and, and pollinator gardens. It was really lovely. This is actually in, near New Bronzeville, but it's an example of how in a very small area that is surrounded by a building a dwelling and um, a walkway, how you can still have a beautiful little oasis of native plants. This is actually at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in uh, near Austin. Just another example of how you can have a bench, pathways, boulders in the middle of your, your wonderful native wildscaping. You can add architectural elements like this beautiful wrought iron focal point, garden sculptures. You can add stones. One of our uh, members makes these beautiful garden stones. And so a lot of us give her a lot of business. Um, a lot of our members have these going throughout their whole entire property and they're, they're just a, a real treasure, but they're another cue of care. Um, you can have signs, you know, plant signage to identify what folks are seeing. 
and there's my National Wildlife Federation certified wildlife habitat sign. So if you can't read it, it might be a little small on your screen. It says this property is recognized for its commitment to sustainably provide essential elements of wildlife habitat, food, water, cover, and places to raise young. So if you certify your property, you can get a sign just like that. That lets folks know there's a purpose to your wildscaping. If you've got a really large area, you can make wonderful seating areas and uh, patio areas. Um, isn't that gorgeous? That was in South Carolina last summer with my family. Not at my family's house, but, um, but we visited a property and I had to take a picture that was gorgeous. You can add that that's me at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center last year for our 25th wedding anniversary. Our husband and I went to San Angelo, or not San Angelo, San Antonio and the Austin area and, and made a stop by Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center on our way back. And so you can add some pretty whimsical garden features like these pretty little butterfly chairs. You can add a more rustic feature like a little teepee. This was out at Bob Jones Nature Center um, out near South Lake. Um, oh, and I do wanna talk about the critters because one, some folks say, oh, critters, what will I do with that out of balance? I would say that the species are gonna keep each other in balance. This is a little diamondback water snake that I actually found in my office closet a couple years ago. <laughs> I don't know how it got in there, but we do live near Lake Grapevine and I knew enough that it was not a venomous snake. I could tell by the vertical jaws, uh, the vertical lines on the jaw that it was a water snake and I could tell by the pattern on the back that it was a little juvenile diamondback water snake. And what I think happened is we had a real dip in the in the temperatures. It had gotten warm. So a lot of these little creatures had come out um, and then it turned cold again. So I think this little one was just trying to find a warm place to be. How it got into my closet that has no outdoor doors and windows, um, I don't know. But anyway, there it was. I just put it in some Tupperware, took it down to the lake, and let it go on its happy way. Now, you do have to be mindful of the venomous snakes, and I've got a, a whole presentation really on, on those that are in our area. What you would probably see most in Dallas County would be copperheads. Um, and you do wanna make sure that you follow the golden rule of not putting your hands and not stepping where you can't see. Um, if you do find a venomous snake, I do have contacts for folks who will gladly take them off your property and relocate them. So if you'd like that information, just let me know and I will be glad to, um, to pass that along to you. And there's just a little close up of the pretty pattern on his back. So black widow spiders. This is a black widow spider. You do have to be mindful again about not putting your hand where you can't see where you're touching. This lives under my compost tumbler handle, but I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to get rid of it. And, um, a mud dauber really feeds on these black widow spiders. And so oh, part of the ecosystem, but I do instruct my husband, if you go out there to put something in the compost tumbler, wear gloves or make sure you look before you reach under um, to, to, to turn the, the tumbler. So just use some common sense, um, but there's no reason to be fearful. Let me just see if there was anything else that I wanted to share about that. Um, one clue when you're outside is to listen to the birds. If you hear the birds really raising a fuss, you can probably be assured that something's happening. Either there's a predator in the area, perhaps there's a, a snake, um, but, but educate yourself as to what you might see because of all the snakes in our area, there are only four venomous snakes in Texas. And as I said, the one that you would probably most commonly see is copperhead. The rest of them are pretty good and beneficial snakes, including the Western rat snakes. So um, anyway, we're, we're delving into another presentation for another day. 
So number 15, the last tip is just to do it. Just take a step and some considerations are that little changes can make a big difference and big changes can make an enormous difference. You don't have to do it all at once. And to look below the surface and consider the big picture and to enjoy the journey because it is an ever evolving process. As you know, these are just some ideas. Um, you know, just choose one or two things that might resonate with you today to implement. Um, you know, I've documented over my property in the last two years, 350 some odd species. And that's just the ones I've documented. And it's really a fraction of what's really there. So it's just always a, a fun, there's joy in, in the journey. And here are just some inspiration for some smaller spaces. You can add a bicycle with a basket as a little planter. Um, as we mentioned, having a, a container gardening. This actually has a little raised bed as well. A pretty little container planting. You can change it out seasonally or you can add perennials that will survive from year to year. So when, when I mentioned we were in San Antonio for my 25th wedding anniversary, one of the places where we stayed, Hotel Emma in the Pearl District, had old propane tanks that had been repurposed into planters. I just thought that was amazing. They're industrial looking, but the softness of the plants I thought was really spectacular. So there's all kinds of things that you can repurpose. And I am doing this throughout my property. I mean, almost everywhere you look, I am adding more and more plants to my yard. I do want to show you to, to the point of just taking one little piece and working with it. Um, this was a view standing at our front door looking out when we bought the house in uh, 2010. So as you see, it was nice, it was formal, um, but it was mostly just turf grass. So in 2017, I decided to turn that little bed. This is where the Agrotina havenensis, the shrubby bone set that attracted all the pollinators in the middle of the concrete with no supplemental irrigation was very, very happy. I decided to turn that into a little oasis pollinator garden. So the first thing I did was cover all that turf grass with cardboard and mulch and just let it sit. And then I gradually started adding plants. I added uh, wildflowers that would reseed themselves. I added some perennial uh, foundation plants like salvias, um, there's some American basket flowers, some other wildflowers. Um, and this was it last year. You can see pink evening primrose, beautiful um, sunset in the background. It's a lot bigger and bushier than that now. Um, I'm looking at the window as, as I'm talking to you right now to see what's out there. It changes and it ebbs and flows throughout the seasons because I'm trying to put things in there that will per, uh, perpetuate themselves, reseed. And so Almost every day is an adventure, but that's an example of how you can take one little piece of your property if you don't want to commit to the whole thing and make a little piece that would be a, a wildscape. Um, this is over near the mailbox. I did the same thing. It was surrounded by turf. Um, I added some of the pink evening primrose, some salvias, some iris, some um, agastache. I've got fall aster in there and um, and it, it it changes. It doesn't look the same now as, as it did here a couple years ago. So I would say no matter what you're doing, make sure you take time to stop and smell the flowers. This is our Labrador Retriever Pearl. She was really featured in a lot of the photos that I cut out just for the, the sake of time, but it's supposed to be joyful. So make sure that you take time to stop and smell the flowers. And this is the point where I would normally ask for questions, but since, since we can't do that today, I did wanna provide my email. If you have questions about anything that I've shared, I'm happy to answer them. You can reach me there at katherinewells333 at gmail.com. 
and from Denton County Master Gardener Association to Dallas County Master Gardener Association. We appreciate you so much. We are thankful that we are growing together and during this unprecedented and challenging time, I just say to keep calm and to garden on and we wish, uh, we wish all of you to stay healthy and happy and safe and sound and we look forward to seeing you in person really, really soon. So thank you again for inviting me today and, um, and blessings to you.